It was a year of groundbreaking achievement and record-breaking growth for the faculty, staff, and students of the University of Maryland School of Medicine. From research and discovery, clinical care and capital expansion, to medical and graduate education and community impact, the School of Medicine excelled. For the first time, research funding surpassed $500 million, and clinical revenue exceeded $340 million. A new state-of-the-art research building opened its doors, and the school celebrated the largest gift in its history, a $20 million pledge made by Dr. Robert E. Fischel and his wife, Susan. Known for inventing life-saving medical devices, Dr. Fischel is one of the nation's most innovative and successful technology entrepreneurs. In 2016, Dr. Fischel received the National Medal for Technology and Innovation from President Obama, the nation's highest honor for technological innovation. When I hear of a problem, my mind immediately starts saying, oh, how could I solve that? And then, sometimes, my mind starts seeing the drawings. With more than 200 patents, Dr. Fischel has invented or improved many important biomedical devices including coronary artery stents and the implantable heart defibrillator. One of his latest innovations will help people who suffer from migraine headaches. It acts on the neurons in the meninges, the covering of the brain, and we found in 50% of the patients will erase their migraine headaches. His gift will establish the Robert E. Fischel Center for Biomedical Innovation at the School of Medicine and support endowed professorships. It's a time of unprecedented growth in research activity and funding, fueled by well-funded senior scientists recruited under the Special Transdisciplinary Recruitment Award Program, or STRAP. Among those scientists is Dr. Charles Hong, Director of Cardiology Research. In his Human Heart in a Dish project, Dr. Hong is changing pluripotent stem cells into beating heart cells. Now we can ask a lot of, a lot of cool questions, important questions, that we couldn't answer before. For instance, why do certain patients develop heart disease? New life-saving interventions may also emerge from innovative research to address the opioid crisis. Dr. Bancoli Johnson is working on an opiate vaccine to prevent overdose. One way would be that the vaccine um, creates molecules that stick, for example, to the opiate molecule and removes them from the bloodstream. Another idea would be that the antibody actually destroys the opiate, opiate molecule. Dr. Mary Kay Lobo is studying the brain at the molecular level to understand what goes wrong in addiction to develop targeted therapeutics. We're all really interested in identifying vulnerable neuron subtypes in addiction and specific brain regions, specifically a brain region involved with reward and motivation, right, because addiction you have um, this unwanted reward and motivation for something bad for you, a drug of abuse. Dr. Donna Kalu believes the key to overdose prevention may lie in understanding why some people are more vulnerable to addiction. What are the neuroadaptations that are really mediating this sort of compulsive behavior that causes addiction to really spiral out of control? Military lives are being saved by the research of Dr. Gary Fiscom and collaborators at the University of Maryland College Park. The research partnership has developed a shock-absorbing system for military vehicles to protect troops from traumatic brain injury. If we conduct a blast that generates a 2,600 G force that normally would cause long-term significant behavioral deficits, we completely eliminate those deficits. Ready, fire in three, two, one. In testing, the shock-absorbing material reduced blast acceleration by 90% and cut mortality to less than 10%. We can measure all we want with our instruments, but until we have the proof that on uh, animal models this also works, we've got nothing. So it's been very important for us to have the collaboration between Dr. Fiskum and ourselves. High impact research is thriving at the School of Medicine and is reflected in a record setting and historic surge in research funding. The total income from grants and contracts rose dramatically in FY18 to peak at $537 million, representing a 20% increase over last year. Looking at AAMC funding data, the School of Medicine ranks eighth among all public medical schools nationwide. Research productivity remains high 
The mean funding per principal investigator rose to $416,000, placing the School of Medicine in the 85th percentile of all medical schools. Cutting-edge technology like the new biorepository will help scientists to conduct research more efficiently. Powered by computer-assisted robotics, up to one million blood and DNA samples can now be stored in this futuristic freezer and retrieved in minutes. Those products would be things like serum, plasma, and we extract DNA from the blood as well for genomic studies. Research innovation depends on private support. Donations to the School of Medicine increased 16% this year to more than $60 million. A major gift from the James and Carolyn Frankel Charitable Foundation will support all of the school's mission areas and establish two endowed professorships. Endowed professorships are very important to any world-class university. It allows us to recruit, retain faculty. For those who are performing incredible research, they're engaged across the campus. They need to be recognized. We need to keep them here. Five endowed professorships were established in 2018, bringing the total to 82. Junior faculty are winning major grants with help from the Research Career Development Program. Some people come in with more knowledge than others, but almost everybody can learn something about improving their grant writing skills. We include a mentoring program because you can't be successful in your career development award if you don't have um, an effective mentoring team. Graduate and postdoctoral scholars are also making valuable contributions to the research enterprise. Postdoctoral fellow Archana Gopalakrishnan is studying how influenza virus interacts with immune cells. Influenza A virus causes infection in your airways, in your lungs, and these are all mucosal layers that are typically layered with a cell type called as epithelial cells. So it makes sense that this would be the first cell type that encounters any pathogen. In the graduate program in life sciences, dual degree student Sai Sachin Deva Karuni is studying the strength of synapses in the hope of developing new treatments for a wide range of brain diseases. Including um, neurodevelopmental diseases such as autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability, neuropsychiatric diseases such as major depressive disorder and schizophrenia, and also neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. From bench to bedside, faculty research is propelling the delivery of discovery-based healthcare in partnership with the University of Maryland Medical System and its flagship hospital, the University of Maryland Medical Center. For Maryland House Speaker Michael Bush, the care was a life-saving liver transplant performed by Dr. Rolf Barth. Speaker Bush was diagnosed with non-alcoholic liver disease, but luckily a sister could donate part of her liver. Never looked back uh, choosing the University of Maryland Medical Center, and I would suggest to anyone else that's going to have a transplant, this is the place to be. After his surgery, Speaker Bush honored the transplant team and university leaders on the House floor. The honorees included Dr. Stephen Bartlett, who was recently named Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for UMS and appointed director of the new program in transplant. We're all deeply moved by this event. It's just wonderful that you've held it for us and we you can't imagine how much we appreciate it. We did 500 transplants last year, but when we all get back to work and every day throughout the rest of the year, we need to try to do more every day. They gave me uh, life for, for uh, a little bit longer time uh, for myself and I'm very appreciative of it every day. In a ceremony attended by cancer survivor and governor Larry Hogan, the School of Medicine opened the Fanny Angelo Cellular Therapeutics Laboratory. This cutting edge laboratory is helping scientists create the next generation of cancer cures for people like Sue Marcheski. Marcheski's leukemia is in remission after CAR T-cell therapy at the University of Maryland Marlene and Stuart Greenebaum Comprehensive Cancer Center. Since then I've gotten to see seven grandchildren and we have two more on the way and it's, I never would have had those things. CAR T-cell therapy involves re-engineering a patient's own immune cells or T-cells to fight cancer. This facility will enable us to, to make uh, vaccines for patients with cancer and sell products for patients with cancer here. 
The lab puts the University of Maryland School of Medicine on the forefront of immunotherapy research and treatment. There's no question that immunotherapy is the most important advance in cancer treatment since I've been in the field. And so for me as an oncologist, it's an incredibly exciting time. The Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology is excited about a new state-of-the-art labor and delivery suite celebrated in a special grand opening event. We feel so grateful that our children have arrived safely, but we feel even more grateful for the opportunity this is creating for the children to come. Deaf for more than 15 years, Mick Doniger came to the University of Maryland for cochlear implants and a chance to hear again. Adapting into this world as a deaf person is very hard. Unlike a hearing aid, a cochlear implant does not make sound louder. Instead, the device directly stimulates the hearing nerve within the cochlea. Mick's implant surgery was done by Dr. Rona Herzano. We make a cut behind the ear. We can then use the path that we generated to sneak in the electrode array straight into the cochlea. Three weeks later, the cochlear implants are turned on. Wednesday, Thursday, Right. It sounds like a robot. It sounds like a robot. Good. Perfect. Is that you? That's me. That is cool. <laughs> now Mick is hearing and speaking even better. It's a big adjustment, of course, but amazed and I want to help. It's good seeing you. Nice seeing you too. The number of faculty practice locations run by the School of Medicine has grown to 60 and planned performance continues to excel. Clinical revenue has grown 24% in the last five years to $345 million. On the education front, the School of Medicine received full approval for reaccreditation following a rigorous review by the Liaison Committee on Medical Education. Overall, it leads to a definitely improvement in the medical education program, not only in our school, but for all schools in the United States. Led by Dr. Sandra Cazada, the school has initiated diversity training for faculty and for students at every level of education, including the medical school curriculum. In this training, the students really get appropriate grounding and awareness of one's own potential biases and what we all potentially could bring into an interaction with any patient. And the school is working with the UMB Diversity Advisory Council to increase awareness. An important milestone for first-year medical students is the white coat ceremony. The event features the presentation of traditional white coats, long the symbol of physicians and scientists. It just feels really good to finally be at this point and have our coats and really see where our future is headed. On match day, graduating students found out where they will be working as residents. Emergency medicine, Albany Medical Center. It means a lot for my, my father uh, for you know, uh, having the vision to bring us here in the first place. I'm not sure if it would have been the same had I been in Ghana. In May, the graduates officially became doctors after an inspirational commencement address by UMBC President Freeman Rabowski. When I look into your faces, I see beacons of hope. Every one of you will touch thousands of lives. It's really exciting. Um, I've been looking forward to this day for a while. I think I knew that I wanted to be a doctor when I was growing up, so this has been a day I've looked forward to it for a long time. Their student journey began with an admissions interview with Dr. Mickey Foxwell, who is retiring after 35 years of dedicated service to the School of Medicine. Community impact remains strong, especially through community outreach. This year, Shock Trauma launched Stop the Bleed, providing life-saving training throughout Maryland. We're volunteering our time as medical professionals to teach the community some basic skills that we need to know about how to control life-threatening bleeding. These West Baltimore Middle School students are participating in the Cure Scholars program. Today we've been working on a hovercraft. Designed to spark student interest in science, technology, engineering, and math. Showing these kids, you know, what's going on next door to them and that they can do this, that they can um, be exposed to the science, be exposed to the biomedical uh, research. If we start early, you know, they can realize that this is a path that they can take with their lives. I think that I can probably be a chemist or an archaeologist 
uh, um, entrepreneur someday. And no smoking. And Mini Med School for Kids is giving inner city children a head start on health. They got testing for allergies through a skin test. They perform lung function testing to see what their lung function is. From groundbreaking to record breaking, the University of Maryland School of Medicine is setting a new standard of excellence in research, clinical care, education, and community impact.